Got it. Thank you, Christy, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for this very important and timely discussion. As Christy mentioned, I'm John Kramer, the moderator for our session this afternoon. I'm a previous board member for the museum and, and currently continue as a volunteer with the museum. We would really like to thank you all for your support of the museum over time. The National EMS Museum is actively refocusing some of its activities, acknowledging that not only is it critical in highlighting and memorializing the history of EMS, but we are increasingly going to focus on educating the community about not only the history of EMS, but the important daily role that EMS plays in their community. And also, using the history of EMS to help mold EMS's future and encourage others into the profession. One of these activities is the We Are EMS initiative, which you will be hearing about in the very near future. The new board is very excited about all of these activities, and we'll be sending out some information to the membership in the very near future. I'd also like to welcome and acknowledge a couple of our board members, Dave Zaman, who is currently the president of the board, and Fred Claridge, who is the vice president. And Christy did a brief introduction, but really didn't introduce herself, Christy Van Hoven, as the museum director. We are very honored this afternoon to have Kevin Hazard and John Moon with us to discuss Kevin's book, American Sirens, based on the Freedom House Ambulance Service in Pittsburgh, of which John was a member and a leader and to talk about the important history of Freedom House in EMS and the impact that it had on the development of EMS. They'll be talking obviously about that, some of the challenges that they faced. Uh, Kevin reflecting as he did the research and John reflecting as he lived it. It's now my pleasure to introduce our two guests. Kevin Hazard is a journalist, TV writer, and former paramedic. His first book, A Thousand Naked Strangers, A Paramedic's Wild Ride to the Edge and Back, was published in 2016. He now continues to write for film and TV with work produced by Hulu, CBS, ABC, and Universal. His journalism has been published at 99% Invisible, The Atavist, Men's Journal, The Washington Post, the Atlantic Magazine, Atlanta Magazine, and other uh, sources. He also serves on the governing board of Global Response Medicine and is a sought after voice on emergency medicine and EMS. He lives in Atlanta. John Moon is a former Freedom House Ambulance Service paramedic, a retired assistant chief of Pittsburgh Emergency Medical Services retiring after 34 years of service to the agency. We'll start the discussion with both of you in just a second. Those in the audience, as was alluded to earlier, as we're going along, we, we have a number of prepared questions, but obviously you have a number of questions on your own. And several of you sent them in ahead of time. Um, the, the mechanism with the call today is such that as with other Zoom calls that you're on, you can raise your hand, we'll acknowledge you and let you go ahead and ask your question. So let's move on. Kevin, I'm gonna start with you first. And uh, what what interested you or brought you into this topic? Why why did you decide to, to research and focus on Freedom House? Um, well, first of all, thanks for thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, you know, somebody asked me at one point if I'd ever heard of Freedom House. It was someone who had read my first book, and um, they just sent an email and said, "Hey, you know, I read your book. Have you ever heard of this? Have you ever heard of Freedom House? Do you know how this story began?" And of course, I had not. And so I started looking into it, and what became clear uh, right from the start was that I was <laughs> I was not the only one who had not heard of it. That that this story had not been told. Um, in depth, in the way that it deserved to be told. And so, you know, as, as someone who spent 10 years on an ambulance, to me, that just seemed, you know, outrageous that the world didn't know 
this story. And then, of course, the more I started digging into it and the more I got to know the people and places involved, I realized that it wasn't just, you know, an EMS story. That This was a big story. This was an American story. And it was full of huge personalities and great characters. And it just got more fun to work on the, the longer I went. Very cool. We're going to follow up on a couple of those things in just a minute. But John, what you what brought you into the Freedom House Ambulance Service? Well, I'd like to say that um, my path there was rather unusual because um, I worked as an orderly in a hospital. And um, I was there one day uh, preparing a patient for discharge. And uh, two Freedom House paramedics uh, came into the room because at that particular time they were transporting uh, patients from hospitals to home. And uh, they just commanded the presence of that room. And uh, they didn't walk in and say, I'm here or anything of that nature, but it's just their mere presence uh, provided a, a air of professionalism and uh, okay, we're here to solve this dilemma. And, and I, I just became in awe of these two individuals. Uh, at that time, there were two uh, African-American men uh, with afros and beards. And that was the style uh, during that time. And uh, it was just the mere fact that uh, they conducted themselves in such a professional manner that uh, I said, that's what I want to do. And uh, at that particular time, I didn't know uh, anything about Freedom House, but I happened to see the patch on their jerseys, or their shirts rather, and um, did a little bit of research. And 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 back then they had le yellow pages, which uh, a lot of people are not accustomed to today. So I kind of scanned the yellow pages and found out where their offices were located. And I went to their offices and... Uh, I'm thinking in my own mind that, uh, hey, I'm an orderly in a hospital. I've transported patients back and forth to uh, surgery and to uh, different areas within the hospital. Uh, what more could I not be prepared to do? So I walked into the offices and said, I'm here to apply for a job. And the gentleman looked at me and said, okay, that's great. Uh, if I gave you a picture of the heart, would you be able to... Uh, diagram the circulatory system. Uh, no. He said, okay, well, if I showed you the picture of the lungs, would you kind of be able to label the respiratory uh, components of it? Uh, no. He said, okay, you're not qualified to work here. Uh, I left there feeling really downtrodden at that particular time, uh, somewhat saddened, but that was that little voice in the back of me saying, John, this is what you wanted to do. So it's up to you to find out how to get it. So uh, I did some research and found out that uh, they were holding the EMT course at a local volunteer fire uh, academy. And I went there for 13 weeks, uh, twice a week and passed the practical and the written exam and I uh, got my certificate along with the patches at that time and went back to Freedom House. And uh, at that particular time, I got hired right there on the spot. And as we often hear, the rest is history. So as, as Freedom House was starting to build up the service, were they looking primarily for folks who had already trained as EMTs? Uh, yes, they were. Uh, because the, the training itself um, was getting ready to evolve into something uh, far more uh, sophisticated than any of us had uh, uh, already had been through. So you had to at least have the basic uh, knowledge as to what you were going to get yourself into prior to uh, being hired by Freedom House. Great. Thank you. Folks, I apologize. It appears that my video has gone off, but I, I'm i hearing well, and I'm assuming that you all can hear me. So we're going to continue to move forward. And hopefully after having closed all my other programs, my video will, will eventually come back on. Um, John, tell us a little bit then. So, so you became interested in the topic, but in order to you know delve into it you've got to do your research you've got to 
to to to find out more how how easy was it to to delve into the the history and and research freedom house uh the history perspective of it is 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 relatively easy because uh the service exec itself was designed primarily for the hill district uh i uh, grew up in the hill um and um so I would see the vehicles. It's just a mere fact that I really hadn't put any uh, interest in it because I was still in high school at the time, uh, shortly prior to them starting. Uh, but from that point on, uh, I, I I guess you could say I I, I got uh, overcome by the, the red lights and sirens of the vehicle themselves. So once I was able to put those two together, uh, it, it made uh, working for them uh, a, a sense of pride and 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 quite an accomplishment uh, from my side because I'd seen the vehicles, I'd seen the crews, uh, but I, I didn't give it a thought on how well trained these individuals were or how sophisticated the equipment was on the vehicle. Uh, and uh, I didn't find that out until I got there. Kevin, you know, you have the experience as a medic and as a journalist, but as you started to approach this project, uh, how did you approach the the research and and to to start delving into what's Freedom House all about and what do I want to tell? Well, it it was twofold. One, because I'm I'm a paramedic, you know, I I was familiar with the white papers as we all are. So, you know, I was, I was aware that, you know, and, and my instructor had been one of the first four paramedics in the state of Georgia. So, you know, he had told us those stories of, you know, late sixties, you know, coming out of the funeral home, sweeping flower petals out of the back of the hearse, you know, embalming bodies one night and transporting the next and the sort of chaos that, that reigned until, until things got more serious. So I was aware of that. I knew that part of the history and I knew that, Freedom House represented a bridge from those, you know, early Wild West days to kind of what came afterward. So I knew that I wanted to get into that part of it um, and explain how we got from A to B. Because if you, you know, it, it's hard for us because you know we're all in the field and you know, have a lot of familiarity with it. But in the outside world, people, it, you know, it's it's people don't recall that people. You know, they don't, that's not how they view it in their minds. Well, 911 always brought you an ambulance and an ambulance always had these kind of people on it. And these kind of people are always, you know, trained and equipped in a certain way. And people have almost forgotten what existed before, if they ever knew it at all. So the, the telling of it, I knew was going to be a big part. But as I started to do the interviews, I realized that, you know, it was the personalities involved that really made this a big story. You know, whether I was speaking to John, whether I was talking to George McCary, any of the other guys who were involved, the thing that kept coming up over and over again was a story of, of a group of people who, you know, came from a place that the world had sort of overlooked. And they were, they all in one way or another were searching for a way to make their mark in the world. And with that theme in mind, I, I you know, and even Peter Saffer, you know, he, he barely escapes the Holocaust and he comes to the United States at the end of the Second World War. And, you know, he has this tremendous sense of survivor's guilt. And so he's looking for a way to, to, to live up to the fact that he survived and so many other did not. And for him, that was going to be medicine. He was going to make a mark on the universe through medicine one way or another. And, you know, that leads him into anesthesiology, which leads him into you know, the CPR studies, which is, I mean, in and of itself is an absolutely crazy story. I mean, it's so bananas to to look at what they were doing. And of course, you could never get away with what he did today. You know, you just you, you couldn't just take people in a hospital and sedate them and paralyze them and and then keep them alive with Boy Scouts. You just they, the world would not allow it. And yet he was driven by you know something deep inside of him to keep going. Um, and to keep innovating and to to make a difference in the world. And that was the same thing with everybody that I spoke to. And it was also, you know, it was apparent from Nancy Caroline's diaries and from, from things that people said about her that she was driven similarly. So on the one hand, I had, I knew I had this story of this medical revolution of how we got from 
hearses arriving at your emergency to paramedics that are arriving at your emergency. But it was filled with these people who had these incredible stories. And I mean, no matter how big or small, you know, Phil Hallen is, is a guy who gets mentioned here and there, um, not often enough, but, you know, Phil was one of the visionaries who helped to create Freedom House. He helped to lay the groundwork. And you know, he started his he started his ambulance career because he was working as an orderly at a hospital in Syracuse where he was studying to get his PhD in English. And he's walking through, through the hospital. I mean, just wrap your head around this for a moment. He's coming from an OR where they have been amputating limbs. So he's he's got in some sort of vessel, I assume, he's got a limb, an amputated limb, and he's moving through the hospital with this leg that has been cut off, and he's going to bring it to the incinerator, or it's going to be incinerated. And as he's walking through, he passes a sign, as he sees out of the corner of his eye, that says, if you volunteer to ride the ambulance, to give you free room and board. He's studying for a PhD in English. He doesn't have a penny to his name, and he sees the free room and board sign, and that's what leads him into EMS, and it's that sitting in the back of an ambulance leads him into public health, and public health leads him to Pittsburgh, where he runs a nonprofit that helps to you know, lay out the, the, the groundwork and the seed money for Freedom House. So, you know, every turn, it was peopled by really fascinating characters. And that just came from calling people, from interviewing people and you know, trying to track people down. I'm um, assuming that uh, processes like these are are similar to uh, in in a certain extent similar to writing academic texts or or articles. But as as you interviewed people, I mean, uh, and this question actually came from a member of the audience. Um, you indicate to them that you're working on this project. You're going to be publishing this book, and do, do you talk with them? either for attribution or for non-attribution? Um, yes. I. If there was somebody who said, hey, I don't want to be, if I'm just going to give you this information on background, will you take it? I would take it. Um, but, you know, Freedom House had been written about many times in a very superficial way. So every person that I reached out to, I said, hey, you know, I, 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 was, I was a little bit afraid of coming on strong, but I said right out of the gates, hey, I'm, I'm writing a book. This is going to be a huge project. It's going to take a lot of time. And I'm going to be, if you're willing to answer, I'm going to call you a lot. I'm going to try to get a lot of information. But the one thing I promise you is I will tell the whole story start to finish. So everyone I reached out to by phone, by email, the first thing I said was, hey, this is for a book project. I wanted people to know that this was going to be the full accounting of what happened and who did it. So uh, nobody... The exception of one person, Mitch, Mitch Brown, um, you know, he, he, he gave me information, but he said, I, I don't know how much, you know, I want to discuss what, what happened. And, you know, through the years, Mitch has been, you know, Mitch is an incredibly outspoken guy. Um, he's a great ambassador for Freedom House, for EMS in general. So he's been interviewed all over the place. So, you know, I, I had a bit of a workaround because, you know, through the decades, a lot of people have wanted to hear what he has to say. So I had a lot of information from him. But for, for the most part, everybody was willing to sit down and give me, you know, give me um, the opportunity to, to get their side of the story. That's great. Um, we'll circle back in just a couple of minutes to talk more about uh, Phil Helen and, and Dr. Safar and Caroline. Uh, John, a minute ago, Kevin referred to Freedom House as being revolutionary. Did you all feel that 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 was the case at that time or feel that impact? Really, um, I would have to say no, uh, primarily because we were kind of caught up in living in the moment. Uh, we, 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 we had a job uh, to service a underserved or, or neglected community uh, that uh, didn't have, uh, you know, the very best opportunities in basically the basic things of life, uh, whether it was food, whether it was uh, shelter, whether it was medical care. Uh, that was the, the impetus 
of what we were doing. Uh, we really didn't set out to try to create a, a different standard or, or revolutionize emergency care. We were so caught up into providing a service uh, to a community that was in need that those things, even though they eventually uh, became out front, uh, were secondary during that time. In interesting thought, but as as is pointed out in a number of areas of the book, um, you were changing the standard of care. You were changing the standard of care very significantly from what had been provided previously in the city and, and what was provided in other areas of the city at that time. Um, but But it didn't strike you that you were were really building a new standard of care? At that particular time, I, I, I still can, can go back and, and say our goal was to provide a better care uh, for a, a community that didn't have uh, the basic needs. Uh, unfortunately, as I look back on it today, um, we, just like every other community, uh, in the city of Pittsburgh, uh, the Hill District had to rely solely on uh, the police uh, to come and and get you and trans you transport you to the hospital. Uh, they made the decision uh, during that time as to whether you were sick enough to go with them, uh, whether uh, they were available, um, and once they did come, uh, they would place you in the back of um, a, a wagon that perhaps that transported a prisoner earlier. Uh, and both officers uh, got up front. Uh, and as I always say, if something happened to you or you stopped breathing or your heart stopped beating in the back en route to the emergency room, uh, you were oftentimes worse off uh, than when they picked you up. Um, then you had the, the problem within a community where individuals could not get to their uh, regular doctor's appointments. Uh, and, and so uh, Freedom House uh, became uh, that mechanism to take the residents of, of, of the Hill District uh, from their homes to their doctor's appointments and, and come back and get them and take them back home. Uh, oftentimes, they were individuals that uh, were immobile or bedridden at the time. So we actually served a very vital need within the community to try to offset something that wasn't there. Kevin, as you were working on the, the project, when did you realize that there was this significant disparity in the level of care, quality of care, if you will, in the, the different parts of the city? How quickly did that become apparent? Um, immediately, you know, every account from the time centered around the fact that the city was resisting it. There are there may be about a half dozen articles about that that came out from 1968 until 1970. So from, you know, Freedom House, the, the very first class who went through Saffer's program um, hit hits the streets April of 1968. Then in 1970, a new mayor is elected. And at that point, it becomes a fight. And so, you, you know, you have six articles that come out in two years. And over the next four and a half, five years, you have 15,000 articles that come down. And all of those centered around, again, this fight between the city and this growing medical service. And over and over again, what people would say, the people involved, the, the community that was involved would say, you know, what existed before we came here was this and it was a system in which the police would determine when a call was placed whether or not they wanted to show up um, when they arrived they would determine whether or not they wanted to provide any care and then they would leave they would toss you in the back and they would speed away and then you would that would be the last that anybody saw of you um, if you were really sick so you know people were the people involved were very aware of what the stakes were and the stakes of course were that their community stood to to die in their absence the community had died in their absence and 
if they were to be shut down, we'd return to those bad old days. And so um, every article I read talked about that, you know, extensively. And, you know, of course, there's a huge case of David Lawrence, which, you know, that was that was probably the earliest example. And, and that happened in 1966 of a very famous person dying a very public death, um, essentially because the city's EMS service was absolutely not up to the task. And then <laughs> as, as the years go on, as, as 73 turns to 74, you, there begins to come this other noise, which is from the other neighborhoods, the wealthier neighborhoods saying, well, well wait a minute, we're stuck with what existed back in 1966. And these other neighborhoods, these poor neighborhoods are on the cutting edge of what could be tomorrow. Why, why don't we have that? And so then you get this other view of, of, of people realizing, oh wait, we're stuck in the past. And not only are we stuck in the past, but we're stuck in a past that could be lethal if your life depended on it. So the, the stakes that were involved um, were clear from the very beginning. And as soon as I started researching this, I, I realized that, you know, the standard of care that had existed, particularly in the Hill District, but th for the entirety of, of the city of Pittsburgh, up until the arrival of Freedom House was pretty abysmal. Um, and, you know, that th that was not a system that was going to change without drastic measures. Definitely. John, we talked a little bit about this um, before we went live, but the the book talks about the the first intubation that you did, and you know you you chatted about that. But can you share that with the whole group? Uh, yes, um, it was quite interesting because I was called to report to the operating room uh, to meet with Dr. Peter Saffer. Uh, didn't tell me where I was going or anything of that nature. So I go up uh, to the, I believe, ninth or 10th floor, wherever the operating room was at that time, and uh, meet him. And he and I walk from his office uh, to the operating room. And we walk directly in. And the thing that amazed me to this day is that everything ceased. People stopped talking. Uh, the anesthetists stopped doing what they were doing. The aura technicians stopped doing what they were doing. And they all looked over at the door uh, at me, standing there with Dr. Peter Safford. Now, I'm sure they had used to, they were used to seeing him go in and out of the operating rooms uh, during his tenure there. Uh, but they were not used to seeing someone that looked like me. Uh, if a person that looked like me came through that door, they were either pushing a mop or a bucket. So they were essentially awestruck of this person that didn't have any tools with them at that time, standing there with the chief of the anesthesia department and chief of critical care medicine. He walks over to the anesthesiologist who was sitting at the head of the patient and said, get up. Not in a very tactful way or would you please or anything. He just said, get up. And uh, he said, you sit down and intubate that patient. Now, at that particular time, if you can picture the operating room was totally silent. Uh, I don't know whether they have them today, but at that time, there were amphitheaters <laughs> in the operating room. So you had perhaps residents or medical students all peering down at this one person. And uh, I sat there and the the equipment was lying right on the patient's chest. Uh, she was not breathing. So I subsequently picked up the blade, exposed the cords and put the tube in. Um, at that time, they were the hard red rubber tubes that had metal tips on them. So these are things that people <laughs> can't imagine today. Uh, but I intubated the, the patient uh, on the very first try. Uh, that was confirmed by the uh, anesthesiologist that had been removed from his seat. Uh, and from that point on, we went from room to room intubating unsuspecting patients that were being prepared uh, for surgery. Unbeknownst to me uh, during that time, 
a week or less than a week, uh, I would take that same procedure out into the field uh, and do it in a patient's home. The, the amazement about that particular time in the operating room is failure was not an option, as I mentioned, uh, primarily because we were in the process of uh, writing the actual manual uh, that paramedics could take those procedures or skills uh, out into the field. So if I would have failed, that would have sent the message that these guys, these lay people uh, that don't have MDs or any initials behind your name, well, we better think twice about allowing them to do that procedure. So I kind of did it there and turned around and confirmed it by going out into a person's home uh, and performing that procedure uh, in the field. Uh, it's great to know that we did that, but what you have to try to keep in mind is the emergency rooms at that time were not accustomed to having a patient come in that was intubated and the person that brought them in did the procedure. So I, I, I was challenged by uh, emergency room physician uh, as to who did it, who told you to do it, and who are you? So I had to answer those questions and, and kind of uh, respond to that challenge. And, and once we were able to overcome that, the, the word kind of got out that these are the types of things that are going on out in the field that Freedom House itself were doing. Not any other services, but these group of individuals from Freedom House Ambulance Service were actually doing uh, to patients. Um, and fortunately for us, the, the hospitals that we service were part of a conglomerate or a group of uh, hospitals. So they were made uh, very much aware of that during that time. Was was Dr. Safar uh, aggressive in sharing that information with medical staff members so that, that he could help diffuse some of that concern? Well, um, it, it wasn't so much that he was uh, aggressive in doing it, but Dr. Nancy Caroline um, had to get that word out. And uh, once, uh, it, you know, just reliving it, uh, once she uh, told me to do it, I thought she had lost her mind uh, because I had not envisioned taking that procedure from the operating room out into the field. I just put it in the back of my mind. You go in, you do it, you move on. But once she told me to do it and I did it, um, she was just overjoyed that it was very successful. So during that time, it was her responsibility as our medical director to alert the various emergency rooms that we uh, transported patients to that, hey, you got these guys that are doing these procedures and they're very, you know, sophisticated and they're very good at what they were doing. So it was her effort in trying to get that word out. And um, she was very successful at doing that. This this is for both of you because Kevin, you alluded to Dr. Safar a little bit, and and John, you just brought in Dr. Caroline. Um, I've I've not I I never had the opportunity to meet either of them and and talk with them. I I got the sense from the book and from other things that I had read that Dr. Caroline was um, initially a little bit reluctant to get involved in this adventure? Is that accurate or am I misunderstanding? No, a hundred percent. Saffer, he, when she came along in, uh, in the summer of 74, that was when Saffer was originally invited to join Gerald Ford's presidential advisory committee. And th at that point, the early work was being put down that, that, hey, the DOT is going to roll out a standardized training curriculum, and somebody's going to have to represent that standard. And, you know, this was Saffer's baby, Freedom House, and he desperately wanted to try to save it. This is, bear in mind, this is a couple of weeks after he resigned his post out of frustration with the mayor. So that happens. He starts thrashing about trying to figure out who he can get to run this program, because what he's trying to do is design, as, you know, as we all know, medicine's ever-changing. He's trying to design a 
I, you know, something of a refresher course where he can bring in everything that's happening now, all the latest ideas and thoughts and technology and, and incorporate them into what already exists in Freedom House and need somebody to lead the charge. And he isn't, every person he reaches out to comes up with every excuse possible not to do it. And there's this brand new resident or excuse me, fellow who's just come out of her residency, who has arrived uh, from Cleveland and he puts a full court press on her. He sends one night she's working in the ICU. He sends three doctors in to, to essentially, you know, uh, yank her aside and 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 force her into this. Nancy Caroline is not somebody who could be forced into anything, so she pushes back. And so over the course of the next two or three months, they go back and forth. And I'm sure when Saffer originally sent three senior fellows to talk to her, and it was coming from him, he assumed that she was going to say yes. And her first communication with him was. Uh, thank you for the job offer, but I have major questions about what you're asking me to do. That's not, that's not the sort of thing a brand new fellow typically does, but that's definitely the sort of thing she did. So she really resisted it and um, ultimately took the job when he agreed to allow her to leave for a month to go to Israel. So at that point, she said, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll take over when I get back. So she, it was not something she understood. It was not something she had any interest in or experience with. It was just something that she eventually got worn down and agreed to take over, which, you know, as I'm sure John will talk about here in a second, um, she immediately began to, began to regret because she realized how big the workload was, um, what the learning curve was, but also this cultural gap that she had to bridge. You know, I mean, here's this Jewish girl from Boston suddenly finds herself with, you know, a couple dozen black guys from Pittsburgh. And she's like, I don't think we're going to get along. We don't know. <laughs> what do we have in common to, to, you know, what's the common ground that we're going to fight this battle from? So, John, fill us in on on how that transition occurred then, because it's it's my understanding uh, she was not terribly subtle. And, you know, how how did she incorporate herself into the program and how did you all indoctrinate her and, and accept her? Well, you know, that that's interesting, primarily because when she first got there, uh, she was met with skepticism. Uh, and, you know, it was rightly so, primarily because we had seen primarily other white physicians come in and spend their time at Freedom House and go on to bigger and better things and things like that. So we looked at her as just another white person coming in to, to make their mark at Freedom House and uh, move on. And so it was up to her to prove to us that we could trust her, number one. And number two is it was up to us to show her that she could be confident in the work that we was actually doing. And it took a while for both of those things to fall into place. Um, primarily because she uh, became more of a, uh, a very aggressive type of individual. Uh, she listened to our calls uh, seven days a week and 24 hours a day. And um, oftentimes admonished us on, on the radio uh, for various types of treatment. Uh, and we, we were not accustomed uh, to someone constantly scrutinizing our every move, uh, particularly at two or three o'clock in the morning. Uh, that was in addition to coming into the, the uh, dispatch center and riding on calls uh, with us. Uh, in addition to scrutinizing uh, all of our patient care reports uh, and, and, and actually red marking uh, whatever she thought was uh, an error uh, and or misrepresentation of, of what the patient actually had. So you, you, you had this battle going on uh, where there was a lack of trust and perhaps a lack of confidence. So those two entities had to kind of come together and and once they did, it became uh, like a marriage made in heaven. Uh, she uh, was able to 
go to battle for us. She was able to open doors uh, for different areas within uh, the hospital that we were not allowed into. Uh, and I often like to paint this picture. Imagine someone that's five, a five foot two Jewish woman walking down the hall with four black guys with afros and beards and, and walking right into an intensive care unit, not stopping at the desk, not saying we're here, but walking right up to a patient's bedside and start doing a, a history and physical on a patient uh, that's in the intensive care unit. What does the monitor say? What's the rate of the IV? What particular type of drug is this patient receiving? Uh, what's her chief complaint? Listen to the lung sounds and let me know what you hear. Uh, those are the things that we were able to accomplish because of her. And, and once you end up doing that, the confidence level kind of grew as well as uh, the trusting level that we would go anywhere with her uh, so you can imagine her going into an all black neighborhood, going into uh, what I would call, and perhaps they don't exist uh, too many today, is going into a soul food restaurant and, and, and eating the same type of food uh, that we ate. Uh, so, or going into uh, uh, an abandoned building. Uh, that was uh, a shooting gallery for, uh, you know, unfortunately, drug addicts and, and being part of, of that overall uh, environment. Uh, she didn't shy away from anything like that. So those are the types of things that she was able to do that build up our trust in her as well as uh, her confidence level in us. Uh, so... Even today, even though she's no longer here, and unfortunately she's uh, passed 20 plus years ago, I still miss that camaraderie uh, that we had. Kevin, hear, hearing John's first person perspective and having had the opportunity to not only interview other people, but review documents of, of Dr. Caroline's look at I think you mentioned you you had the opportunity to review some diaries through the courtesy of her family. What what did you get of her perspective of that transition and that engagement? Um, a lot of self doubt, which is interesting from someone who's as accomplished as she is. If you look at what she did here in the U.S., what she did in Israel, what she did in Africa. I mean, with, with zero agricultural experience, at one point she started a food program in East Africa just because she saw that there was a need and she undertook it. So this was not someone who shied away from a challenge, but she's very young when she begins this program. You know, when, when she joins Freedom House, she's very young and she's untested and she's totally uncertain of herself. And so part of it is, you know, there's a cultural gap. You know, I don't, I don't think it's, you know, it's not the same today. We, you know, the idea of, of, you know, a white person eating a soul food restaurant is today not strange, but, you know, for that era, that was a big deal. So there's a cultural gap, but for her, there's also this um, ability gap that she has to figure out how to how to span. And you know, she she has never heard of a paramedic and or of an EMT. She's never set foot on an ambulance. She has quite literally no idea what's expected of her. And yet, what is expected of her is that she's going to take this group of people and turn them into the best possible versions of themselves. And and she's never done anything like that before. And so she's uncertain how to do it. So she begins to listen to calls on the radio and tries to figure out, okay, this realizing immediately, this is a totally different type of medicine than what I'm used to, which is ICU medicine. This is medicine on the street, which as we all know is, is not even, it, it's the most extreme version of emergency medicine. And so she doesn't have any experience with it. And so she just says to herself, okay, I'm going to throw everything I have into this. I'm going to do this all day, every day, nonstop to the point that she stops doing her other rotations. Um, she puts a, a cot in the crew room and sleeps there. She runs calls with them day and night. You know, she throws herself into it. And it's that, it's that dedication. It's that, you know, that's such a, a wonderful answer to, I'm not sure how to do this. I'm not sure I even can. Then I guess I better give it every ounce of me that, that exists in order to, to make this thing happen. And, you know, that's, that's what emerges when you, when you go through her stuff is this, this very uncertain, person who's just beginning her career, who's been handed a huge challenge, 
and who meets all the doubts that come with it with just a very ferocious work effort. For for both of you, did did she get to the point where she understood the significance of her contribution and and could acknowledge and appreciate that? I I, I truly believe she did. Um but I think her overall goal was to make sure people recognized what we did at Freedom House. Uh, it, it was somewhat uh, not unusual for her to sit back and, and, and allow us to uh, be projected out uh, toward the public. But I think her crowning moment was that she came into an organization where uh, you would say other people were not as receptive and, and was able to come out with something that the world itself wanted to emulate. And I think that's the crowning moment uh, that she was able to, to, to really accomplish that feat uh, with the group of individuals that uh, society said uh, wouldn't amount to anything uh, or the least likely to succeed. Mm -hmm. And and she was able to build that confidence into us to the point where uh, we had no doubt that there was nothing uh, in that field or in reference to pre-hospital care uh, that we couldn't accomplish. Kevin, do you think she recognized the significance of her contribution? Um, you know, I do. Uh, it, it It's interesting to note that the very first people to use emergency care in the streets were actually the Israelis. She brought a draft of it with her uh, when she moved to Israel. The book had not yet been published in the United States. And she, when she started their national EMS program, she used the blueprint that she had helped develop in Pittsburgh. So she was certainly aware of her own contributions. But I think if you asked her um, at the time or years later, she didn't view it as something. She, she viewed what she did in a a much uh, dimmer light than she viewed um, the people who worked for her. You know, she said time and again in, in various iterations of, of things that she wrote through through a number of years that she owed a debt to Freedom House far larger than than anything that she herself, you know, was able to rack up. And and that came down to the relationships of the people that she had. You know, she knew that she was a fish out of water. She knew they had no reason to trust her. That you know, that these were people who were waking up every day to go to a job for a city that was actively conspiring to take them down and that they should have been bitter and they should have been angry and they should have been distrustful, especially of her. And they and they were not. They they welcomed her in when she proved herself to be um, a legitimate part of the team. And, and that relationship that she built, you know, helped. She believed at the time to, you know, sort of pull her out of an incredibly dark period and also to catapult her forward. So I think... She would probably, as John said, I think she would probably point to um, the work of Freedom House as being a greater achievement than than her own contributions. Very nice. John, we, we talked about uh, airway management in the context of intubation. What other advanced skills did you have available uh, to your, your team? Well, I, I, I look at a lot of the things that are, that are, being done today um and 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 i'd say wow we we were so far ahead of our time that it actually boggles my mind uh just to give you an example and i i, I just love to use this uh we're 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 in opioid epidemic crisis right now and um the uh, drug to treat that uh oftentimes is is narcan now, everybody has Narcan, uh, first responders have it, fire have it, police officers have it, uh, even some addicts themselves have it. You can go to your local drugstore and get it. But what uh, people fail to realize or don't know is that Freedom House uh, gave Narcan back in 1972. We were the very first uh, service, obviously, in the world to administer Narcan outside of the hospital uh, to treat uh, heroin overdoses. And um, we did it in, in, in a very unique way, primarily because it, we didn't inject it directly into the patient. Uh, we kind of titrated it 
uh, in an IV. And, 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 and we use the patient's uh, respiratory rate as a guide. If your rates started slowing down, we'd give you a little bit more. We'd speed the, the IV up. But the beauty of that is very few, if any of our patients woke up in the back of that truck. And that was designed for that purpose because we wanted to keep you more or less in a daze, a confused or semi-conscious state until we got you to the hospital in a more controlled environment. So they could fight with you and do what. So no one actually woke up and fought with the paramedics or jumped out of the back of the vehicle and run off down the street or, or any of those things because it was by design to kind of keep you in that, that state of euphoria for lack of a better term, until we got you in a more controlled environment. Now today, who knows? Uh, this seat at the head of the patient, the onboard suction unit, uh, the 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 oxygen uh, unit, uh, telemetry. Uh, we we're the first to transmit uh, an EKG from the field back to the emergency room to uh, discuss it between ourselves and the ER physician. Uh, if you look at the, the terminology of medical director, uh, <laughs> that's a normal course of action. Every service now is required to have one. Uh, and, and, and so those are the things that oftentimes we take for granted uh, because we're so accustomed to always being there. And very few people actually realize where they came from. Were, were you given the flexibility to aggressively treat the patients or did you have to call in for permission to intubate or defibrillate or administer Narcan? Well, that's that's interesting because there was no such thing as standing orders uh, back then. So all of our uh, advanced treatment was with the consultation of, of Dr. Nancy Caroline. So uh, it wasn't as if we were calling to ask or for mere, you know, permission, it was more or less like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. We have this and we're going to do this. Well, what do you think you should do? And things like that, because that level of confidence was already there. So it was more or less like a one-on-one -on -one conversation between our medical director and the paramedics in the field, because we had built that type of rapport uh, with her. I, I couldn't help but smile when you were talking about titrating naloxone, because there are a lot of folks now that would like to get back into that uh, mindset rather than uh, delivering large boluses and automatically always waking the patient up. Um, Kevin, I, I don't know if this is a fair question or not, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If you had the opportunity to talk with Dr. Safar, what would you ask him? What would be your big one or two or three questions? Man, there's, there's so many. Um, you know, I'd love to, to hear about his time toward the end of the war when he was working in a hospital in a city that, you know, was embroiled in open combat, oftentimes directly out in front of the, the door. What, what was that like? Um, you know, I'd love to know what was, and I guess I wouldn't ask him what was going through his mind when he did the test, because by all accounts, um, he was overflowing with self-confidence. But I would just love to know, like, just hear, to hear him tell his side of, of those CPR studies and, and, and how he devised it and what convinced him that he could pull this off. Again, I'm not sure you'd get a good answer to that, but boy, I would just love to hear him tell his side of the story. Um, and then honestly, I, I would be, I would be curious to hear what he said about his relationship with the city, because, you know, that he, he battled the city long before he had troubles with freedom house. He, he began battling the city, um, when he first devised the idea of a paramedic program and, and nobody would pay any attention, he continued to battle the city after the death of David Lawrence. And then he continued to battle it um, when Freedom House came along. 
and he he had these these philosophies that he like of 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 how he would negotiate with people. And the first one was sort of like you know this very nice like oh I'll try to do this and this. And he had written all this down. And the second one I'll do this this. And the third one is a bulldozer, and I will just come in and knock you over. And I just love the idea of this guy who would start by taking people to certain restaurants around the city. Um, there were some places that did not allow Jews, and, and his mother was part Jewish, so there were places he wouldn't he wouldn't go to the country clubs. He took him to these towns. These these uh, restaurants in the middle of the city, and he was in his mind. He always referred to town and gown, um, which was you know a doctor who was not only good in the hospital but also good politicking, and that was really what he prided himself on. And I would just love to hear him talk about starting ICUs, starting anesthesiology departments, you know, pushing through the idea of these, um, you know, of a paramedic program, you know, getting going with the resuscitation resuscitative work that he did later and every step you know he was negotiating with reluctant city leaders to do exactly what he wanted and ultimately it always went his way he managed to get people to do what he wanted and so i would just love to just hear him talk about that process and and you know <laughs> about turning you know from from the sort of the nice guy into the bulldozer and understand he's a tiny human he's not a big man and so i would I, you know i would just it would be very interesting to watch very cool. Um, John, you you were trained directly by Dr. Safar. He was responsible for not only implementing the program, but but training and, and oversight for a period of time. When, when he transitioned, and again, this may be a little bit unfair, I'll apologize. When, when he transitioned to Dr. Caroline, did you all feel abandoned by Dr. Safar? Uh, I would say yes, somewhat, because uh, it was someone that we had uh, developed a relationship with, uh, and it, it it wasn't out of the norm on one end, because we had become so accustomed to individuals coming through Freedom House more so than coming to Freedom House. And as a result of that, you're you're absolutely correct. That was a a, a somewhat sense of abandonment there, uh, because we really didn't understand that we were going to get something uh, better, and 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 that was uh, Nancy Caroline. And as as I think back over those times with both of them, and and I think you know you you asked. Kevin, uh, what questions he would ask him. Um, I, I, I wouldn't ask either one of them any questions. I would just tell them, thank you. Thank you for going above and beyond. Thanking you for taking a chance on uh, individuals that uh, society had otherwise pushed to the side. Uh, thanking you for uh, having a group of individuals that uh, you gave the confidence and the strength and the inner strength in to overcome uh, hurdles and barriers and distractions and um, false promises uh, and under enormous odds. And, and those two individuals were able to kind of instill in that into a group of individuals that, um, you know, it, it was a confidence that we didn't know we had and they were able to to, to bring that forth. So I would, you know, say I owe them both a deep debt of gratitude, a deep debt of thank you uh, for, for doing what other people would not have done. Uh, obviously we've, we've talked about the importance of, of both Dr. Sapphire and Dr. Carol and Kevin, you alluded earlier in the discussion to Phil Helen um, and, and, uh, implied the impact that that he had had. Could could both of you take a minute and and talk about Phil, who he was, how he was involved in the program, and and how influential he was in helping to make things happen? You can um, start, Kevin. Uh, all right. Uh, you know, he and John are still very close, so I'll 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 keep this as brief as I can to give John the floor. You know. 
Hallen was a true visionary. He recognized a need that almost nobody in the country was recognizing, which was that there was nobody to uh, provide care where you fell, whether it was through injury or illness. And he, he noticed it very specifically where he lived, which was Pittsburgh. And he noticed that it, the problem existed most acutely in the city's black neighborhoods. And he set about um, creating a system that would fill that need at a time when nobody knew what it was. As a guy who didn't have any real medical background to speak of, um, but who was a political organizer, and he knew simply that this was the right thing to do. You know, he was not um, a black guy that came from a disadvantaged neighborhood by any means. He was quite the opposite, and yet um, you know, he he saw this as a human problem, and to him that was it was unacceptable that it would it would exist anywhere in America, but certainly in a major American city. And so he gave everything he had to creating a, a, an organization that would fix that problem. John? Um, Phil in itself is a very humble uh, individual. Uh, he is the type of person that uh, is not driven by accolades or recognition. Uh, he likes to see the fruits of his labor but he also likes to stay in the background uh, and observe the fruits of his labor. Um, his heart is as big as gold, and he uh, always is looking out for better things for other people. Um, and I, I, I spend, you know, a lot of time with him, and 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 right now I've I've grown to know that. Uh, he has a heart for people, and um, he doesn't shy away from letting people know that. Uh, everything he does uh, is to make life better for someone that is less fortunate. So uh, as of right now, uh, he's almost 93 years old, and um, uh, he and I spend a lot of time together. Uh, I go to his house almost weekly and we sit around and obviously reflect on EMS uh, things. Uh, but that's where his heart is. His heart is for EMS. He still wants to be kept updated on it. And he has a heart for people. And I think that's his strongest asset. You, did, did his background in healthcare, having worked in a hospital in Syracuse, affected or, or well, Contributed is probably the wrong term, but uh, had a strong influence on his interest in the Freedom House program? Uh, I believe it did. Uh, but from that standpoint, he really didn't have a kind of refined knowledge of, of what he was going to get into until he came to Pittsburgh. And, and once he saw uh, what was going on in the hill and the struggles that were there, uh, his heart started reaching out, started becoming soft for the people uh, in that community. And he knew at the time that he was in a position to make a change. And he devoted uh, a large part of his career to making that change for individuals that were uh, less fortunate. Uh, Freedom House itself, um, oftentimes was a, a nonprofit organization. And with him being uh, president of the Falk Foundation, that was his job is to try to input funding into nonprofit organizations. And, and Freedom House obviously was one of those. Uh, and like Kevin said, he was a visionary. Uh, and he saw a vision uh, within a community and an organization. And he was able to put those parts together, put those missing pieces together, which was uh, the members of the Board of Directors of Freedom House and Dr. Peter Sapper and uh, the Director of Presbyterian Hospital at that particular time. He was able to bring all those pieces together to create what we see today as uh, emergency medical services. John, as, as was acknowledged in the introduction, you, you continued at EMS, you continued with the Pittsburgh uh, Division of EMS and, and retired as an assistant chief. Did other individuals in, uh, who were Freedom House paramedics 
continue in EMS? Uh, yes, they did. Uh, unfortunately, not a lot of them. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of saddened to say uh, and I, I don't want anyone to take this in a different format. I'm not a disgruntled former Pittsburgh EMS employee. Uh, I love the department. I love the people that work there. But we're talking about a different time. If you go back into 1975, uh, there was an agreement uh, between Pittsburgh EMS and or the city of Pittsburgh at that time to take all the Freedom House's employees. And uh, the saddened part about it is that uh, the agreement said it had to take you, but it didn't have to keep you. So unfortunately, uh, and I'm speaking from experience here, there was a systematic way uh, put in place to eliminate, if not all the Freedom House's employees. And I view that as if you remove the individuals that are making history, you essentially remove that part of history that uh, the people uh, created. So I had to endure those same type of uh, hurdles and barriers and distractions. Uh, and sad to say, everyone uh, didn't have the inner strength that I had. Uh, so as a result of that, um, I was able to to reap the benefits of of, of working for Pittsburgh EMS, uh, but as I I went up through the ranks, it still remained my goal was to keep the the legacy and the history uh, that Freedom House uh, created, because I even today I still owe a debt of gratitude to this organization that I don't think I'll ever be able to repay. So my way of trying to uh, repay it is to keep this legacy and keep this part of history uh, alive. And, and that's why uh, I commend you all for, for this presentation because it all uh, fits right within that plan of trying to keep the legacy and the history of Freedom House uh, alive. Thank you. Um... I just want to remind remind folks in the audience, I have a, a, a whole bunch of other questions that I can continue uh, pursuing. But if you have questions that haven't been addressed yet, please feel free to raise your hand and, and we'll address those. Um, John, I want to play off your comments just a few minutes ago and fast forward now to, um, I guess, officially May 2023. I mean, Pittsburgh EMS just announced their new EMS chief, who is the first African-American and the first woman to serve as chief of Pittsburgh EMS. Uh, for both of you, thoughts and reflections on that other than it's about time? Um, I'll put it this way. Um, the desires of my heart have been fulfilled. And right now, uh, my heart is smiling. Uh, the unfortunate thing about that is it took almost 50 years uh, for that to happen. And um, I believe, and I, and I know for sure, I've known her for 20 plus years, uh, that she will do a great job. Uh, I have to point out that uh, she was the best person for the job. She did not get that job because of her race or her gender or because of this administration. She earned that job. She was the very first person in the history of Pittsburgh EMS to actually work every job classification in that department, from EMT to paramedic, to crew chief, to district chief, to assistant chief, to deputy chief, and now the chief. No one in the 48 year history of Pittsburgh EMS has ever accomplished that goal. So right now, uh, she's my signing star and, and she's been able to show that all of the uh, hurdles and barriers and distractions and broken promises and deadlines and, and things that 
we went through at Freedom House was all worth it because she made sure of that. Kevin, thoughts based on everything that you've learned about Freedom House? There's very little I can add to what John just said. Um, although, <clears throat> what a uh, what what a nice cap to the legacy. Very much so. Uh, William, we'll get to your question in just a second. One other question that was submitted by one of the attendees before uh, the webinar, uh, specifically for John. Do you remember the video guy riding with you in the late 1980s recording Pittsburgh EMS? Uh, that, that's a loaded <laughs> question. <laughs> yes, I do. I believe uh, he was one of the individuals that took that still photo of me sitting in the office, if I'm correct. Yes, I was, John. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank I you had, very much. Thank, thank you, John. You, and, and thanks, Doc for doing that for me. I just yeah. had to say hi, John. Uh, yeah, th thank you for putting me on the spot, but I can't remember <laughs> what I had for breakfast tomorrow, yesterday, but I can remember 30 no, years but ago. You drug me around the city with that camera unit so we could capture all that stuff for Mosby, for ACLS that we did training. If you remember, we were doing it during the heroin epidemic. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. What yeah. year was this? Uh, 88, 89, I think, wasn't it, John? It was, yes. uh, I yes. had just met Walt and Dr. Stewart. And they got us on the units to ride. Yeah, it was during the China White uh, epidemic yes. uh, yep. in the city of Pittsburgh. You're yeah. absolutely correct. Yeah, John showed me more of that city at night than I ever. And I love that city a lot, but uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure listening to you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denny. Uh, William, did you have a question? He'd take off mute. Uh, first off, uh, John Moon, it's, it's an honor to meet you, uh, Kevin also, and this is probably more for Kevin than John. Kevin, my, my interest in this uh, meeting is, I want to hear a little bit more about the, the research and how you put uh, the book together. Uh, I, I must admit, I'm only about a third to a half of the way through. Uh, liked your writing style from Thousand Naked Strangers. I like the writing style in this. Uh, how many did you interview? How long have you been working on it? Uh, you mentioned you repeatedly called back uh, to, to several uh, folks. And uh, what just so I want to hear a little bit more about you, you putting this book together and the construction of that, if, if you don't mind. And sure, thank you. of course, of course. Thanks. Um, so I, I got onto the story, and I believe it was around August of 2018. Um, and the first thing I did was, uh, I just started Googling it and I, I assumed that I would come across, you know, sort of a definitive account of Freedom House and very quickly realized I was not going to, but there were enough very small accounts that I had the gist. I, I kind of, I, you know, I had the, the two minute version. So from there, I just started looking up anyone whose name appeared in any article written about it. And finding ways to reach out to them, whether it was through social media or or over the phone. I think I, I cold called um, George McCary, got him one afternoon. He was sitting in his recliner, and you, I could tell he was like, "Who is this?" But he he you know he talked to me and answered my questions. Um, Phil Hallen um, at one point hung up on me because um, I asked him a question he thought I should have already known the answer to, which is really very funny. Um, but you know, that was the start of it was tracking down as many people as I could. And I think, um, I think I got about there, I think maybe six people um, who were either on an ambulance or Phil Hallen, um, interviewed them as, as much as I could and as many times as I could to get all the different pieces of their story. And then, you know, like I said before, I got lucky in the fact that this in the city of Pittsburgh just turned into a huge fight. Had this happened you know, had, had Freedom House happened in maybe a different city, it would have it would have been different. But but the fact that they were resisted so long and so stubbornly by the city government, you know, it became a very public fight. So there are quite literally thousands and thousands of articles. And so the hardest part was trying to lay out a timeline, um, to, you know, to determine sort of how things flowed, because you know, there was, there was a lot of up, ups and downs and backs and forth. And as we all know, you know, EMS has, has uh, developed in fits and starts. 
And so I, I did my best to try to lay out what it looked like in the city, but I also then went around and tried to lay out what existed in other cities, you know, it, um, in order to say that, you know, Freedom House were the first paramedics. Like I needed to know who else had been training and when. And, you know, very quickly I realized that many of the other training programs did not come along until 68 or later, for instance, Los Angeles, um, or some of the ones that, that came along in 67 or 68, like Miami or San Francisco, um, were mainly focused on cardiology and were not full spectrum, you know, probably what today, or Belfast for that matter, probably what today we would call a cardiac tech, or at least what 15 years ago you would have called a cardiac tech. So I did, you know, I tried to find timelines of other cities. And then I just, you know, the hardest part for me was figuring out what the, you know, what the themes of this book are. You know, if you watch a movie, you know, very, <laughs> except for the very worst movies, they're not just about, you know, a guy wakes up, you know, it's like the, the sort of boy meets girl, um, boy falls in love with girl, boy makes a mistake, boy loses girl, boy runs to the airport just as her plane is about to take off and gets girl back. Like that would be a really boring movie. You need to be invested in, in both boy and girl in order for you to care about whether they come back. So I needed to figure out how do I get to the heart of what the story was and why these people were there. And, you know, I was certainly this way as a medic. And I think, you know, a lot of other people from Freedom House were, there's this reticence to talk about yourself and to, to discuss, you know, how you felt in various moments and, you know, sort of your hopes and fears. And so I had to, you know, just keep asking stupid questions. And I'm sure John will tell you, I asked many stupid questions, but eventually, you know, you get to a point where someone remembers a little detail and then you can begin to peel it, you to unpeel it. Um, and, and that was the case, you know, I was able to get to the fact that, you know, these guys were all coming from, you know, really difficult situations. John grew up in Atlanta and then made his way to Pittsburgh. Many of the other people were born and raised in Pittsburgh, but the story was quite similar, regardless of where they went later in life. Mitch Brown is a perfect example of that, of, you know, of a guy who's done all sorts of things with his life, but, you know, found himself in the late 1960s, uh, you know, a little bit unmoored and looking for a way to you know, to announce himself to the world. And so that became a theme that, you know, again, I followed with Peter Saffer and I followed with Nancy Caroline, both of, both of whom, despite, you know, their incredible achievements at the time that they entered Freedom House were, were sort of in a similar place. So, you know, unraveling that little piece of it and then figuring out how to weave that through was a big part of the story. I spent a lot of time in archives, um, you know, the, 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 I guess what differentiates people who will do something great from, from the rest of us is that people who do something great, they know they're going to do something great. Nancy Caroline kept everything from the time she was a little girl. It was like she knew that she was going to make a difference. And so she wanted the world to be able to, she wanted somebody to be able to keep track of what it was she had done. And so she kept everything. You wouldn't find anything of mine. Um, probably nobody would go looking for anything of mine. So I guess it's going to work. Um, you know, Saffer, I was lucky enough to speak with one of his sons. I was lucky enough to speak with his wife and some of uh, some of the people who worked for him, which was, you know, that alone was, um, uh, you know, fascinating to be able to speak to, you know, a, a woman who, who was his secretary for a number of years and, you know, was able to give details of what it was like to try to keep up with him or, or you know, his children, what it was like for them to try to get his attention, um, you know, and his wife, who, who they met. You know, they met very young uh, under difficult circumstances. The war was just coming to an end and their, their home was in, in rubble and neither of them knew how they were going to make their way in this new, you know, pulverized place. But yet she instantly recognized him as different from all the other, you know, young boastful boys in their city. She recognized a certain seriousness in him and a certain determination, which, you know, was something that can be recognized in John from an early age. I was able to draw these parallels to different people who were kind of going through similar things. And that was, that was a big part of it. But, you know, following this story from start to finish was going to be very tricky because so many people enter it at different times. And so that's how, you know, I came to start the story with John um, because I felt like his journey was emblematic of Freedom House. He was not the first one there, um, but what he went through to get there and his experience upon arrival very much summed up the ethos of Freedom House and of the people involved. And so that was how 
you know, he kind of landed at the center. And so it was just a lot of little decisions I had to make to make the story make sense. But I'll be honest with you, writing it took two seconds because I'd spent so much time researching it and thinking about it. And it is such an incredible story that I, I was racing myself to type it out because I wanted to see what was going to come next. Um, yeah, it was a fascinating process, but, and frustrating at times, you know, from 2018, when I started it until 2022, when the book came out, you know, it's four years of, of, you know, digging the same hole, but, you know, eventually I popped out on the other side of the world and here we are. And, and if I may follow up on that, if you had unlimited number of pages to put in your book, is there a story that you now you wish you would have told or you might have told better or longer? You might have given us a little bit more information on. And I agree with you, John's story, the way you started with him, the way his life uh, started rough and the way he, you know, he felt like he had to find something and he thought he had found something. Uh, following him as he's heading that direction was very compelling, was a great way to start the story, even though you took us all the way back to uh, Civil War and napoleon and all that which was which was uh was, was good also but once again my question is there something that you left out that you're looking back you're going maybe i should have put this in or is it for the next book uh there's <laughs> nothing i look back and think i should have left it in there are things i wish i could have um uh uh you know Saffer has jewish um descent or is of jewish descent and yet uh he's forced into the Hitler youth and he, he ends up in this really weird camp and which is very abusive and very difficult. His story of growing up in, in Austria, both pre and post Nazi invasion is really, really fascinating. That by itself, quite honestly, is a book. Nancy Caroline's story. And I would, I mean, there's, she, at one point she, she quit school and went um, and studied with Noam Chomsky. I mean, I would have loved to spend more time digging into this, really fascinating person who plus all the things she did after uh you know but but i had to stick to a certain degree to to certain facts and um you know so the life that you know really got uh raked over the coals the most was john's um you know because it in so many ways really informed what freedom house was but my goodness every person involved had an incredible story you know mitch brown was a medic in vietnam and who wouldn't want to learn more about what was happening with these corpsmen over in Vietnam and what were they doing and, and how were they operating? What was that like? Um, you know, there's so many, so many stories like that. I don't, I don't know that anybody involved in this program was not a truly fascinating person or gosh, Phil Howland. I had to cut out so much stuff about his fundraising efforts. He, the, the, there's a house that was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright called the water garden and the family who that house was designed for was a very wealthy family who was one of the early donors of Freedom House. And he had to keep going over and over again. And the way that he got them to give the money was he realized that the son was trying to get out from underneath his father's shadow. He lived, his father, the father had started this huge business and the son was sort of the caretaker who'd come in afterward. And he could not get the guy to commit to this big amount of money that he needed. And finally, he realized that everybody referred to him as junior. And it made him bristle every time someone called him junior. And Phil Howland in that moment said, that's it. He's tired of living under his father's shadow. So he pitched him as, hey, here's an idea that you can have something all for yourself that your dad's never thought of. And he sat down and signed the check that day. So there's so many wonderful things that happened, um, you know, that that just couldn't get in because there would have been, been it would, it'd be a 1,000 page book. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you, uh, John, you also, and I'll. Be quiet so other people can uh, chime in here. Thank you. Kevin, based on on your experience with this book and as a medic, how has your perspective on EMS changed or has it changed? It's given me a, a much greater appreciation for the history. You know, I think most of us look at white paper, Johnny and Roy, and then here we are today. Um, without understanding that, that there's this incredible thing that, that took place. Nursing has Florence Nightingale and, you know, there's all these different things that pop up, all, you know, police officers and firefighters are just sort of heralded in all these different ways. But EMS didn't, didn't have this, this fantastic origin story or so we thought. And, 
you know, having uncovered this, this wonderful piece of history to me just gives me a greater sense of pride in the job that I did. And also, um, you know, a, a just a deeper understanding of how quickly we got here, you know, how fast all this happened and how far uh, things moved in such a short period of time, how far things moved from, from 1966 until 1975. It's really, it's genuinely um, a rich piece of history and I'm just glad to have known it. Thank you. John, what's your perspective on EMS now? Well, um, it's a great perspective right now. Um, I think um, the history and the legacy that uh, I try to uh, keep in the forefront uh, during my tenure with uh, Pittsburgh EMS uh, is finally coming to fruition. Uh, it, it took a while. Uh, it took a lot of patience and a lot of persistence and determination but uh, I'm beginning to see the fruits of, of, of that labor right now. And uh, it really, it really uh, makes me feel uh, honored and privileged to be a part of this. Thank you. We have uh, just a couple of minutes left. I, I can't uh, thank you both enough. Um, I've had the opportunity to chat with John several times in the past. Kevin and I met uh, in January. Uh, he he appreciated the fact that I had tabbed uh, my book so that I can refer back to specific areas. But uh, thank you so much for sharing this story. Thank you for the museum, on behalf of the museum, to be a part of it. Um, I'll turn quickly to, uh, actually, we have three board members on now. Uh, Dave Zeman, who is the president, Fred Claridge, who is the vice president, and Cindy Kessler, the secretary. Uh, comments, thoughts, observations, plug the museum, uh, go for it. <laughs> I always plug the museum. Uh, thanks, John. Um, I want to thank uh, John and Kevin. This is just outstanding. Um, I, could, I could sit and listen to you for hours and hours on end. So Try not to get cornered by me in Reno, otherwise you might not. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, but one thing I wanted to ask, John, and, and all the, the fantastic work that, that Freedom House did and, and things, but we still have in EMS a lack of people of color pursuing our profession. And one of the things I see is the, is the museum's uh, charge is obviously helping with, with recruitment, retention, and, and educating the people, not only of the past, but of what can happen in the future. How do you see, or where can we take this museum to help people of color, underserved communities, um, bringing people into this just wonderful, wonderful profession? Well, it's, it's interesting that you ask that because, uh, when I was at Pittsburgh EMS uh, back in 1990, it was a problem where, unfortunately, the department went 10 years without hiring an African-American. Uh, I brought that to the attention of uh, my superiors and was able to um, design the first diversity uh, 365 recruitment program for their department. Uh, and I used it based on Freedom House's format, where I went out into the community to different uh, job fairs and community centers and uh, uh, expose the community itself to this as a, a career path. Uh, and it proved to be very, very successful all while I was there. Uh, unfortunately, once I retired, uh, we kind of fell back on the, the old axiom, if they were there, we'd get them. Uh, so I, I really think that the community from an EMS standpoint is your ally. So if you engage with your ally, uh, and I think exposure itself equals opportunity, uh, it's easy to, to put something on Facebook or LinkedIn that we're hiring and things like that. But if you don't put the foot soldiers out there in the community, uh, it's going to fall by the wayside. So I think in order to change the face of EMS, and that was my intent at that time, is you have to invest in your community because that's where your allies are. And so in other words, the EMS services across this country 
uh, has to go out into the community uh, to recruit from the community in which uh, you serve. Fred? Sure. Uh, I guess I just have a comment and then a really quick geeky like question after my comment. Uh, first of all, I just want to express my gratitude to both of you. Uh, first to you, John, for taking all those chances and doing all those things that allowed me to become a paramedic several years later. Uh, you know, when I can hear the stories of one of the very first people who did the job that I loved so much uh, during the time that I did it is a real treat. And it's been a treat to get to know you over the last year or so. And Kevin, I don't think it can be overemphasized what you alluded to, which is that there was a real uh, hole in our history of how all of this stuff got started. And you're absolutely right. Many people thought it was Johnny and Roy and Miami and LA and Seattle and all those places. And to me, uh, in many ways, this is the real Genesis story, for lack of a better analogy, about how advanced life support service uh, got started. And that's vitally important. And I thank you again so much for uh, you know, writing that story and making sure that we'll have it now uh, forever. It was a big hole that needed to be filled. And now for my geek question, is one of the original Freedom House ambulances around anywhere, or have they all been assigned to the uh, dustbin of history, so to speak? Uh, I'm pretty sure they are all uh, been demolished uh, by now. And, and one of the reasons is uh, all of that equipment uh, was turned over to uh, the city of Pittsburgh uh, once it uh, consumed Freedom House. So uh, there's no more uh, ambulances, only photographs uh, of the vehicles themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lerner, you have a question or comment. Yeah, thanks. Um, oh, sorry. I'm in the car, so it's funny colors. Um, <laughs> I uh, I just wanted to say, I think one of the incredible things about the story is, you know, not really realizing what a badass Nancy Caroline was. Sorry for the bad word. But I, I do think it's amazing if you think about the time and women at that time that she was able to take a leadership role. And, and I think when like the the women in EMS group um, at NAMS, she talks about this, like, I think we have lost track of the fact that, that she actually did an amazing thing. And um, anyway, I just wanted to thank you for the story and reminding us that, you know, she wasn't just the name on the textbook we all read. Um, and so anyway, mostly I just wanna thank you for writing the book because it really was incredible to read it. Yeah, thank you. Um, Nancy was a really a fantastic figure. One of the amazing things I came across while while researching was that when, when she was in Israel, she responded to the Coastal Road Massacre, which is a very famous incident in which um, uh, militants attacked a bus full of Israeli citizens and set it on fire. And she was among the first people to get there and treated uh, patients, both Israeli and Palestinian, while being pinned down by automatic rifle fire. Um, I mean, she's really an incredible human being. I mean, just at every stage of her career was constantly in the middle of something um, and then would go home and, you know, just make herself a cup of tea. I mean, she's really just a genuinely fascinating uh, human who, you're right, has somehow uh, been overshadowed by the book, you know, it's she's she's emergency care in the streets in many people's eyes, but you know, there's a really fascinating person behind that title. I, I, a final question for you all to think about, but you know, you you have touched on an, an extremely important historical aspect of EMS that is is certainly a part of the mission of the museum. Do you have any thoughts or? comments or perspective on um, the museum helping to facilitate some of the things that you've been working on or vice versa? Uh, yes, I, I, I think the museum is doing a, a uh, 
great job of trying to to keep this part of history alive. Um, and it, it's it's interesting that you said that because with the exception of maybe a year, a year and a half ago, um, I didn't know the EMS Museum existed. Uh, now I do. And I think uh, if it makes the history and the legacy of EMS its priority, I think this part of uh, history that Freedom House was a part of or that created, uh, that legacy will still remain, uh, but we have to kind of keep it in the forefront. And uh, one of the ways that I'm trying to do that is by getting Freedom House's emblems on the side of Pittsburgh EMS's ambulances. And uh, uh, that way, at least that part of history uh, will also uh, remain alive. Uh, there's a display in Pittsburgh at the Heinz History Museum uh, regarding the attributes of Freedom House. So it's a continuous process. And, and I really, really, really appreciate all the effort that you guys are putting forth to help me keep that process alive. Thank you very much. We have uh, exceeded the witching hour again. Um, it was fabulous reading the book. It was even more fabulous hearing about both of your histories. Um, on behalf of the museum, thank you so much for your willingness to delve into this and to, to work with us on this program. For those of you in the audience, again, we appreciate your support of the museum. Please continue to go out and lobby your friends, family, and coworkers. Um, the, the museum uh, really needs continuing support. You'll hear more about that in the future, but uh, thank you all for everything that you do on a daily basis. John, thank you so much for your service throughout your entire career but particularly early on. Um, Kevin, thank you for deciding that you wanted to delve into this in much greater detail <clears throat> and for writing a great piece on it. Thank you. With, with that, thank you all. Have a great evening and a great rest of your week. And we'll see you all someplace soon, somewhere. Take care, all everybody. Right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. John, thank you very, very much.